it's actually great to be back at ACE. I think I skipped the last couple of editions, and uh, it's, a, it's one of my favorite conferences for a number of reasons. And uh, okay, so let's get started. Um, growing adaptive organizations. So the title itself contains a couple of, um, in my opinion, interesting words. Um, one is growing, which is not frequently heard when you talk about organizational change. And the second is adaptive. Now, what is an adaptive organization, first of all? Well, as, as Paul was mentioning, um, there is a lot of emphasis in, um, in the agile world, in the agile space, on the processes and tools and frameworks and stuff. But if you look back at the origin of agile, uh, there was a debate like 20 years ago if this new approach to software development was to be called adaptive software development or agile software development. And the two are kind of synonymous. Um, and then eventually they decided for Agile for a number of reasons, including copywriting. Um, so the, the reason why I decided to use Adaptive is because in the last 20 years, then again, Agile has become very much associated with a practical way of doing things in a certain way, using certain tools and certain approaches and certain practices. And I want to step away from that a little bit and talk a, more about the reason why we try to be agile, which is we try to adapt. We try to uh, respond in an intelligent way to a changing environment or changing needs or changing requirements. So we, we try to be intelligent and respond to what happens inside and outside. And the metaphor about growing, it will, I hope it will, be, will become clear in a second. So, um, what I'm going to do is, uh, I want to try a little thing. I, I'd like to open a space of about one or two minutes, and in this space you have an opportunity, which you might take or not, it's not a task I'm assigning to you, it's just a space that I'm opening. And if you want to find someone near you who wants to talk to you, and if they want nothing personal, is there right? But if somebody wants to talk to you, uh, I would like to hear from the audience and uh, about this, this concept. I assume that many of you know what Agile is. Okay, I'd like to hear, I'd like to know from you what you think that Agile is not. Hmm? Would you like to try that for, for a minute or two? Then again, you don't have to. But if you find a partner, a partner, have fun for a minute or so. Go for it. Any idea that you might want to share? Well, I hear people talking, that's a good sign. I cannot really see you because of the light, but I can hear you, so you are talking. Um, anybody wants to share? Just a word or a sentence, something very practical? So the question is, what Agile is not? Yes, please. is not a set of golden rules that always work. Thank you. Yes, please. It's not a silver bullet. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm sorry, you are saying? It's not an excuse. It is not an excuse for not having a plan. <laughs> or, thank you. And? Is not a distraction. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So yes, as Paul was mentioning at the beginning of this conference, Agile does require discipline and focus and a number of other things. So thank you. Um, I'm sure that there's someone else, but I really need to move on. So thanks a lot for your contribution. So we know that Agile is not a silver bullet, it's not just rules, uh, it's not a distraction. And uh, so, okay, so where does Agile com come from? If you if you think at Agile, the way it was conceived, um, don't worry about the screen, look at me, look at me, okay? That's why you're here, okay, look at me. Um, 
if you think at Agile, the way it was conceived like 20, 30 years ago, it was designed to work for one, si one single team developing one product. Remember? Like extreme programming or Scrum, you have the team, you have the product, and, and, and so on. Um, and then, over the years, and that was until 10 years ago, and then about 10 years ago, we realized that there was another problem. And the problem is that not many companies these days develop one product using one team. Usually we have multiple teams, or we have multiple products, or sometimes the two together. Um, and so we came up with all the scaling frameworks regarding Agile, uh, safe, dead, less, you know, all this stuff. In the last few years, what we realized is that Agile cannot be considered something that you use only in production. It's not only about producing something. For Agile to be really effective, it must be something that is integrated into your organizational culture. So, for instance, um, you, you can do whatever you want, Paul. <laughs> uh, so, for instance, um, how can you be um, flexible in a project, like accepting new requirements and so on, or manage risk, as Anna was explaining a minute ago, if your finance is not agile as well? How can you create a culture for agility if your HR is not on board? And so, slowly, we moved uh, from this concept of Agile is for developing software to the entire organization has to incorporate an Agile culture in the way they, they work and operate. Um, which means, basically, that the whole concept switched from Agile is like a production engine to Agile is a way to structure our organization as a living organism, which is why I decided to use the title growing. I don't believe in agile transformations. Now, this is a strong statement, and let me explain. I do believe that organizations can change. They do change all the time, even if you don't want to, even if you don't plan to. Okay? They do change all the time. But I don't believe you can transform a human entity I believe that they change because they want to, or at the very least, because they have the seed for changing. So, thanks a lot. That was very gracefully managed. <laughs> so, let's talk about adaptive organizations. Now, the metaphor of the chameleon is because an adaptive organization is an organization which is constantly able to scan its surrounding environment and adapt and respond. It's just a metaphor. So the chameleon is just a metaphor, but you want to have this constant environmental, environmental scanning. Uh, you want to constantly learn from your environment and from yourself. You want to experiment constantly because by feedback you can adapt better. Uh, and you want to move away from, um, you know, imagining that things will go in a certain way, and rather you want to use historical data and do projections uh, basing on, a more on a more scientific basis, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, um, I'm going to need to, to, to save a little time, but anyway, I'll go quickly on this part. Um, a production machine like the 19th century factories, were designed in a hierarchical way for a very simple reason. Because a hierarchical structure is very efficient if you need to govern and control a production process. Okay? That's the reason why it was designed that way. But since we are no longer focused only on production of material goods, physical goods, but we work with our intellect and knowledge and experience and relations with other people, basically we are knowledge workers, we know that organizations that structure themselves as networks of people, they tend to work more effectively in, uh, in being adaptive. Hmm? So, not only they change, haha, it's now there, okay. Um, not only they change in the way they perceive value as a revenue thing, 
but also they change because they perceive value as multidimensional. So, for instance, um, it's very hard for an intellect-based organization, for a network of people, not to, uh, not to be efficient in the way they collaborate. Okay? You must be efficient in the way you collaborate. And at the same time, you must learn all the time. So what I'm trying to say here, basically, is that um, when it comes to adaptive organizations, value is not only revenue. Value is learning, interacting, and generating whatever your clients and users and customers need. But all these three things are equally valuable. Just thinking that revenue is the reason why your company exists probably is no longer sufficient. Now, revenue becomes a mean to an end, and this end is much more multidimensional and complex than just producing stuff. So the question is, how can you change from a mindset, from a paradigm of the organization as a production engine, which is what we thought even in IT was 20 years ago, how can we make this change? How can we grow into an adaptive organization, which is on your right side of the screen? So how can we do this? Um, now, there is a... I'd like to use a couple of quotes here. Hmm? Uh, this is a, an Italian physicist, and he writes a number of very interesting books about philosophy and physics. And he says that not only we learn, but we also learn to change our conceptual structure, to adapt to what we learn. And I'll give you an example. The, the image on the background is basically a cosmological model back to the time when we believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and everything else would revolve around us. Okay. Um, now, as you can imagine, when we realized that it was not really like that, but in fact we are only a speck of dust in an infinite emptiness, that was a profound paradigm change from a religious standpoint, from a philosophical standpoint, and from a scientific standpoint. So, not only by observing reality, we understood something about the world, we also learned how to change our perception of ourselves and how we position into uh, the larger whole and we interact with the larger whole. Now, how does this relate to uh, organizational change or evolution? Is because I, this part is very important, this slide is very important, is because I, I believe that we need to improve our ability to observe the ecosystem in which we live so that we can infer what's going on and then improve it accordingly. Let me say this again. We need to improve the way we observe the reality in which we work so that we can infer its behavior and then improve it. We cannot stop to the surface. We need to be smarter than that. So, I've, I've noticed in my many years of working with organizations that um, there is one thing that tends to keep things in place, it's what I call the keeper of the status quo. And this phenomenon I call obfuscation which, as you can read, is a state of having limited information, limited feedback, and limited communication between people, and that prevents self-reflection. That prevents understanding what's going on below the surface. Okay. So, by the way, I'm not ranting, okay? I'm not complaining. The reason why I want to talk about, with, about this with you guys is because I'm hoping that I can give you one or two more tools that you can use to improve yourselves and the world around you. 
Okay? So I'm not saying that this obfuscation is evil or whatever. I'm just saying we live in this state of obfuscation, which is intrinsic to the way we perceive, and also it's amplified by the way organizations are designed. And let me give you uh, more detailed examples of what we can consider obfuscation. So one is, oops, sorry. One is what we call segregation, what I call segregation. I'm pretty sure that you have experienced organizations where the functional silos are very tight, meaning that there is very, few, very little communication between, for instance, finance and HR, or between uh, HR and marketing, or between marketing and production, or between production and quality assurance, which is another interesting phenomenon that I see. Even the fact that we tend to structure organizations saying that you have a quality assurance manager here and you have a program or project development manager over there. And these are different responsibilities and they govern different peoples and you have these functional styles. Even this kind of separation is very interesting because it's not at all holistic. It's not a holistic view of what you are trying to do, which is deliver good products with high quality, good market prices, and so on and so on and so on. And by the way, keep people happy in the process. Okay? Just having these functional silos is, is kind of strange if you think about it. If you think at your organization as a, as a living organism and not as a production engine. Um, but I've seen organizations where this separation was actually so strong that people in war department were prohibited to even emailing people in another department without going up the hierarchy and then going down again. Okay? And as you can imagine, by doing so, we isolate people, we prevent communication, we hide information, we obfuscate what's going on. And so, for instance, in quality assurance, you, you realize that there's a problem and you realize that three weeks later, because there was no communication before that, of course, then you have a problem, which is a very practical problem. So even though it sounds that I'm talking about you know, theoretical stuff, what I'm trying to tell you is that these things have a very practical impact on the way you live and the way you work and the products you develop. So this is one, segregation is one. Um, another, if you're wondering why I'm going back and forth, by the way, is because my remote doesn't work from that distance, so I need to go here. Um, sectarianism, which is basically discriminating subgroups, thinking that one subgroup is better or worse than another group. Have you ever listened to conversation like, conversations like, oh yeah, those idiots in, marketing, in the marketing department, they sell products and they don't even ask us? You know, this kind of conversation, thinking that marketing are a bunch of idiots and you are so smart or vice versa. Okay? Believing that one group is much better than another group, okay? that's what's called sectarianism. And it's a very good way to keep people apart. It's a very good way to increase obfuscation and deplete communication and so on and so on and so on. Then again, I am not ranting. I'm not here to say, oh, I'm so terribly sorry about all this. I'm here to tell you, um, if you learn, if you have a vocabulary that you can use to discuss these things, if you can create concepts in your head, if you can, if you can increase your ability to detect these things, maybe you can improve them. Maybe you can uh, make your life uh, better for you and the people around you. Uh, feudalism, boss and servants, okay? master and servants politics. Um, people who like power, they want to keep power and they have other people who are trying to be very pleasing to them. Okay? Uh, th that's another way to obfuscate where uh, people can take responsibility. Okay? The other one is scapegoating, talking of responsibility. Now, scapegoating is when somebody, for instance, makes you responsible for a project. So now you're responsible for that project or whatever. 
Okay. Now, the problem is responsibility is one thing that you can only take voluntarily. You, you will not be responsible, you will not feel responsible because someone tells you that now you are responsible. Okay. And especially if without that responsibility, you are not given authority to decide. If you are given the responsibility for something over which you can take very few or no decisions, real decisions, serious stuff, okay? If you are given responsibility for something over which you have no control, sorry, you're a scapegoat. And that's another way in organizations to hide something, which is we are trying to hide real responsibility and accountability by creating these structures that don't let you see reality for what it is. Because now the real accountable or responsible person, we, we no longer know who it is. Um, Backpassing. That's another way of obfuscating the way organizations work. It's when it's the classical you know, top-down micromanaging thing, when you, when you assign tasks to people, okay, even if you work in Agile and you, you, have, a, you have a Scrum Master and, and, and the PO assigns tasks to you, this is what classical dysfunction, if you are assigned tasks, rather than taking tasks for yourself, okay, that's a clear indication that you are being told what to do. And you don't necessarily have much information about what comes before you and what comes after you. You don't have organizational clarity. You don't know what the impact of what you're doing on the larger system. You're just being assigned tasks. Okay? And in that kind of situation, when something goes bad, because it does, okay, you can hear a number of converse conversations like, oh, well, well, I did my part. It was not my fault. Okay? I did my part. Okay? I was told what to do. I did my part. Okay? And, but you still have a big problem, but you know, everybody did their part. And then you have scapegoats, and so nobody is responsible. So then again, what I'm suggesting is, please learn to observe these things. Learn to change your conceptual model of your organization. Learn to become aware of things that are hidden behind the organizational um, complexity or complication, probably I would say. Complicated process is another one. When you're forced to use a tool that is you know, taking you 50% of your energy just for using the tool, not for, not for what the tool is designed for. Or when you have excessive bureaucracy. Then again, I'm not, bureaucracy is important, depending especially in the context in which you live. I've been working with biomedical companies. And, and you know, if it is a life-critical thing, I assure you that we need to go very slowly and document everything that we do because it's a life-critical situation. So in that context, yes, please, give me bureaucracy if it is not for the sake of itself, of course. Hmm? Or maybe you need less bureaucracy, but then again, that's another way of creating a number of a large amount of information that you don't really need, which obfuscates the information that you do really need. It's another way of obfuscating the way you work. Uh, model communication. Oh, man. I mean, I, I, I was in a company a couple of days ago, a large company, a bank, and I've been involved in one of those you know, remote meetings with people on the phone on the other side, you know, like five people in the room and one guy on the phone on the other side which basically killed the entire meeting because the communication was completely devastated because we had different bandwidth, people in the room and people on the other side, we had different bandwidths. Um, so everything that will uh, make information get lost because the bandwidth is poor is another way of obfuscating. Um, multitasking when you try to do too many things at the same time and you waste brain cycle, or long feedback loops, that's another one. Long feedback loops means that the way that we work as human beings is that if something happens here and then the effect happens 
two weeks from there, okay, it's very hard for our brain to correlate directly what happened two weeks ago with what's happening now, most of the time. Hmm? Um, that's why in system thinking we say that uh, today's problems are yesterday's solutions. Hmm? So the shorter feedback loops you have, the more clarity you have about what's going on. You are less obfuscated if you use shorter feedback loops rather than longer feedback loops. So then again, all of this stuff, all of this stuff I'm talking about because I'm trying to give you conceptual tools to change the way, the way you think about organizations. Hmm? I'm not complaining about this stuff, I'm not pointing the finger, I'm not saying that this is bad or good or evil, I'm just trying to give you a conceptual framework and some language that you can use to change your environment, to understand and change your environment. Um, let's see, there's another, I'm going to skip this part. And there are two things I'd like to tell you before we go. So one is, remember the slide at the beginning when I was um, telling you, I was asking the question, how can we change an organization which is based on the paradigm of being a production machine and change it, let it grow, so that it becomes an adaptive organization which is basically a living organism? Okay? That's the question I asked. Well, actually, it was more a provocative question. It was more kind of a tricky question because even adaptive organizations, they still need to produce something, right? Maybe you need to produce software, you need to produce solutions, you need to produce, I don't know, financial investments, as Anna was talking, was saying. So, but you need to produce something. There is a part of the organization that is designed to produce. And there is another part of the organization that is designed to be more responsive. And there is, the difference between these two things is because production, by definition, must be efficient. In a production process, you want to reduce variability because all the variability you have makes your process more expensive and probably decreases quality. So in a production process, you want to reduce variability. But in the way you interact with your external environment, the way the, the, the organization interacts with the market, you need to be adaptive and explorative and so on. So the question is, how can these two things coexist? And for me, Agile has the answer. Because there is a part of Agile which is all about process control. And that's, that's fine, we need that. But then there's another part of Agile which we tend to forget about which is much more about self-reflection. I've seen, I'm, you know what, is a, what a retrospective is. However, I very rarely see retrospectives addressing improvements that are related to how the organization works as an organization and how people interact. I have very rarely seen retrospectives saying, okay, we need to get better in dealing with different opinions, right? Usually, retrospective is, yes, we need a PO to provide us better, you know, better specifications, okay, good. But how do you deal the situation where you and the PO have different opinions about something? Why so few retrospectives try to address communication uh, aspects? Okay. And that's, I believe that that's because we are not still using that part of Agile, which if you look deeply at Agile, was there from the, from the beginning. It's that part of Agile that is telling you individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So you need to improve your processes, but at the same time, you need to improve the way people are interconnected, interrelate, the way they work together. But it's not just people is the entire organizational structure that we start to rethink. We need to start to asking ourselves as an industry serious questions about how and why we still use organizational structures that clearly are not effective anymore in the 21st century. 
we need to start asking ourselves questions like, why don't we have the courage to change some of these structures? And of course, if you're working in very traditional organizations like banks, for instance, that's gonna take a long, long time because banks have been around for centuries. But if you are working in a modern organization or if you are creating your own organization, why can't you be courageous? Why can't you ask yourself in interesting questions, not about how you produce, but about who you are and who you want to be as an organization? Hmm? Look straight in the eyes what you're trying to do. Try not to be obfuscated by uh, by what you are, um, but by old models, so to speak. So I believe the model's done, right? We are supposed to, to finish it now, more or less. We have, okay. So, um, a last bit of uns what I call unsolicited advice. Um, remember, I was using this metaphor of growing adaptive organizations because I don't believe you can transform an organization. I cannot even believe you can design an organization. I can believe it, as a farmer, you can create the conditions for the organization to work in a healthier way. Okay? So I like, I like the metaphor of a farmer when, when it comes to organizational development. Um, however, you're still dealing with people. So there are three things that I'd like to suggest when you work with people, especially people who don't think the way you do, people who have different opinions, people who come from a different background, um, people who have traditionally have always looked at organizations in a certain way. There are a couple of things that I'd like to um, remind you. Um, be empathetic. Which, and it's pretty nice that um, the conference opened with that theme. Okay. Be compassionate, which means try to understand that we all try to do our best, the best we can. Um, and for some people, the best they can may, not be, may be below your expectations, but it's the best they can. Okay. And in the end, if you really want to promote change in the organization, the one thing that I think always worked is, some it sounds like a kind of a you know, trivial advice, but no, really be kind. I, I do believe that being kind in organizational change is the only way to have deep, profound, long-lasting effects. Whatever you try to achieve by force or by rapid change, will not last longer. So, so that's my advice to you. And uh, thank you for being here. And I'll be around for the next couple of days. Oh, actually, I'll be running a workshop tomorrow on, uh, on listening, on active listening. So if you're interested, I'm done. Thanks a lot. Thank you.